Hey, uh, this is Chris, and today I want to talk about how induction heads seem to cause uh, meta-learning. This is preliminary work, but I think it's one of the coolest things that we, we seem to be discovering about transformer circuits, and so I'm really excited to chat about it. If you haven't watched my colleague Catherine's uh, previous video on how induction heads seem to cause a bump in the loss curve, um, you should really check that out before watching this video, because this video isn't going to make a ton of sense without it. Now, uh, meta-learning is probably, uh, at least to me, it's, it's the most impressive thing about large language models. It's really um, the thing that's most surprised me uh, about them, and about I think probably it's, it's maybe, in some ways maybe the, the most surprising thing about deep learning um, in the, the last number of years. Um, and in fact, uh, it's, I think, so striking that um, the GPT-3 paper decided to go and make it um, really the title of the paper uh, is that uh, language models are few shot learners. So the idea here is we, you know, when we when we train models, normally we expect them to learn over training. But with these large language models, we're starting to see that you can go and put examples in the prompt or in the context, and they'll learn as they read, so that they can go and do later things in the context that they they couldn't do earlier in the context. Um, and this has led to all sorts of interesting things, like you can go. Um, and do so-called prompt design, where you go and you uh, train models, um, or you design these these little prompts that instead of training the model, you can you can sort of get it to do what you want by just designing the prompt. And in fact, um, there was this little meme with uh, Andre uh, Karpathy um, that you know maybe maybe the future of computing is that we'll just design the prompt. Um, I think that's that's somewhat joking, but um, you know I think it, the the fact that we're sort of joking about things like that sort of um, I think is is sort of striking about how interesting a property um, meta-learning is. Um, and it's deeply mysterious. Like, we, we design neural networks so that they'll be able to go and learn. But somehow, when you train large enough language models, you seem to get meta-learning for free. Um, and so that's, that's really interesting. Um, and, that, you know, I, I really want to know what's going on. Um, so there's, there's a previous paper. Um, this is um, the, the Kaplan et al. Skilling, skilling Laws paper. Um, and I think it has a really clever idea for how to think about uh, meta-learning. So normally when we think about models learning, we can, we can look at a loss curve. Um, and it, you could think of this um, you know, as the, the, the curve describing how the model learns over time. So you know, at, we have our training step. Um, and as we train the model, our loss goes down. Um, and actually... And in this loss curve, it's for a, a two-layer tra uh, transformer. Uh, we can see the induction bump from the previous video. Um, so the idea that Kaplan et al. have is that you can also um, go and look at this not as a function of training step, but as a function of token index. You can take the fully trained model right at the end here, and you can ask, um, you know, okay, how how good is it at predicting the first token? Well. You know, it's not very good at predicting the first token. How good is it at predicting the second token? Well, it's also not very good at predicting the second token. But, um, you know, so these are you know, the unigram statistics and then the bigram statistics and, and the entropies of those. But then, you know, as we go on, um, we start uh, to get much, much later in the, in the prompt. Um, and you've already sort of squeezed out all of the, the short-term distances, but the, the loss continues to go down. Um, and so if the loss is continuing to go down, somehow that means we're getting information from earlier tokens and using it to go and predict later tokens. And so this curve, in some ways, it's a little bit like a learning curve, but it's us learning over the context. It's us learning from earlier tokens in the context how to go and predict later tokens in the context. Now, you have to average over lots of examples to see this, but um, if you average over, over lots of examples in your training set and then just look at token index, you start to see this curve. Um, and I think this is a little bit of a grandiose way to describe it, but um, you know, I'm not the one who came up with the idea, so I feel free to, to describe it that way. Um, you could sort of think of this as a meta-learning curve. So you could think of this as being your learning curve, and you could think of this as being your meta-learning curve. It's describing how you're, you're going and uh, how your meta-learning is progressing. Um, but you could think of both of those as really being slices or projections of a more general 2D picture. Um, so here we have... Uh, our model over training. So here's these are snapshots that we saved as the model was training. 
and we can also look at the token index on this axis. So um, if we go and we uh, average over this axis and project it all down, we'd get the loss curve. And if we take the final slice here, um, we get the, 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 the curve describing how good we are predicting different tokens um, at the end of training. So this is, this is sort of a generalization of the, the diagrams we saw before, and it allows us to get this, this nice 2D picture and see, get an overview of what's going on. And, and yeah, so I think the, the most obvious and striking thing when you look at this diagram, or at least to me the most striking thing, is that there seems to be kind of a discontinuity. Um, uh, we can zoom in on it. And that corresponds to the bump that we saw earlier and that we discussed in the previous video where induction heads form. So we can see induction heads forming um, in this, in this uh, plot. Um, so something that we can then do is we can say, okay, uh, you know, we'd, we'd like to somehow summarize how good the model is at meta-learning into a single number. That would be a really useful thing if we could do it. Um, and one way we could try and do it is we could go and take, you know, how good we are at predicting, say, the 50th token. Um, and uh, we can look at that for different points in training. So we can, you know, right at the beginning of training and then after a little bit and so on. Um, and uh, when we learn uh, about induction heads, we see a little drop, um, but not a very big one. And then we can go and take um, how good we are at, at uh, predicting a token much later in training, or much later in the context. And we can see um, we're, we're better at predicting it, and we have a much bigger drop. And if we subtract those two numbers, you could think of that as kind of being uh, the amount of meta-learning we're doing between token 50 and token 500. Um, so this is in some sense a measure of meta-learning, and the, the lower it is, um, the better we are at meta-learning. And we see that there's this really abrupt drop, um, which happens right at the bump, um, right at the point where we think that in induction heads are forming. Um, so that's really interesting and suspicious. Um, and I don't, I don't know about you, but this is, this is like, you know, this is a, a really sharp curve. Like it's almost, it's, it's, you know, it's not exactly like this. There's a little bit of maybe bending here, but it's, it's almost just an abrupt um, uh, discontinuity. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty discontinuous. So that's, that's kind of an unusual thing. Um, and uh, yes, seeing things like that, uh, it's very striking to me. Okay, so um, one question you might ask is, you know, how significant is this, right? Like, how, how big a deal is it that we're getting, um, you know, this negative 0.4 uh, nats of meta-learning? Um, our losses is measured in nats from, from information theory. Um, what does that mean? And I think there's a few ways you could interpret it. So uh, in the case of this model, it's an 11th of the loss. Um, so one way you could think about it is that means that when we predict token 500, um, it's almost as though we get to go and predict like maybe every 11th token um, we're able to go, we get sort of get to for free, just magically know the right answer and say it with 100% probability. That would cause the same, uh, you know, losing reduction of an, of an 11th of our loss. Um, another uh, interpretation of it is uh, it's 0.4 nats per token. Um, but nats are kind of a, a tricky way to think about things. Um, I, I prefer to think about things in information theory in terms of bits. So let's convert to bits. That's about 0.5 bits a token, which is about one bit every two tokens. And remember that a bit um, is enough information to distinguish two, between two things. So it ends up being meaning something like you could uh, sample the model twice and take the better token or take the better sample every two tokens. That would that would be another thing that it would mean to go and drop by 0.4 nats. So. I think it really is a very meaningful, uh, very meaningful drop. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we're already pretty far out in the context by token 50, and we're still getting that much more. So um, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so another way we could picture this is, uh, in some ways, the important thing is, you know, how much more information are we, as we move to later tokens, 
how much more information are we squeezing out and reducing our loss by? And before we discover uh, induction heads, we see that you know we pretty early on um, you know it basically becomes zero and we're, we're not getting very much more. And then all of a sudden, so this is sorry this is this is the derivative um, with respect to log token log because it seems like um, there's sort of uh, yeah it, se it seems like probably the the order of magnitude of tokens that you have before you seems to be the the more important thing. Um, if you look at these curves, they sort of seem very linear on a, on a log axis, but not on a linear axis. So we'll take the derivative with respect to the log token. Um, and yeah, and it seems like before we discover induction heads, you know, maybe the first 20 or 40 tokens, 50 tokens, um, you're still getting pretty significant learning or pretty, pretty significant reductions in your loss. But it pretty quickly levels out after, after token 50. And, you know, as you go further down, you're, you're not learning much. Um, whereas... Uh, after induction heads form, we, we continue to see these really significant um, reductions in loss. Um, so that's really interesting. And then if we take a further derivative and we ask, okay, well, you know, how is our ability to go and increase? So we have our first derivative, which tells us, you know, as we go this direction, how is our ability to predict tokens um, uh, going and, and increasing? And if we take a derivative this way, we can ask, uh, how is our ability to go and predict tokens um, improving, imp our, our ability to get better at predicting tokens, how is that improving as we go and we move this way? And we can see that there's, you know, I mean, you could just visually see it here, but it's, it's nice to confirm there's this extremely, extremely, um, uh, you know, sharp discontinuity that really, really dominates the story. So, you know, to first order, the story of meta-learning is that in the span of a few snapshots, um, which is really just a few hundred steps of training, um, we go from not being very good at it to being quite good at it. And that's that's really the story of meta-learning. Now, this is for a small model. Um, this is only for a, a two-layer attention-only transformer where it's really easy to study things. Um, but we can also look at large models. And large models also seem to have a bump. Um, it's right here. Um, and that's at about, and now we're measuring in tokens. Um, so that's at about 10 to the 9 tokens. And it turns out that if you go and measure the same uh, notion of, of doing a difference between how good you are predicting two tokens to go and look at, get sort of a meta-learning score, um, right at 10 to the 9 tokens, um, we see an abrupt drop, an abrupt discontinuous drop. Um, and it seems to not matter that much how big your model is. Um, across uh, you know several orders of magnitude, um, they all drop in a pretty similar way. Now before, right at the beginning, the large models are better at predicting than the small models are. But after the drop, um, the meta-learning score is really dominated um, just by which side of the drop you're on, which side of this, this bump um, uh, you're on, and not matter that much uh, how large your model is. That's kind of the opposite of what I usually think about model size. Usually I expect model size to just make everything better, but here we have something that, to a pretty significant extent, is it's just the same amount regardless of model size. So that's interesting. Um, in any case, that's, that's kind of uh, rambling a little bit, but I think the, the striking thing is that this is still happening in large models. And so the, the thing that we, we, you know, to me that's crying out when I see this pattern is what the hell is happening when we see this drop? Now, of course, I've, I've sort of already given away the theory we have, which is that it's induction heads, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a sec. Um, uh, but, you know, I've, I, I, I think that it's, it's really, you know, we, and maybe maybe one reason why I'm so struck by this is I'm I don't know about you but I'm I'm used to seeing weird things in loss curves. In fact, this is like a pretty smooth loss curve, all things considered. Um, you know, it's not that unusual to have random bumps and quirks in your loss curve. Um, but here, this 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 thing that seems at first glance like a relatively um, you know not that big a deal thing and 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 you know everyday phenomena turns out to be doing something like really the, the most interesting property of models to me um, is is like undergoing this like phase change at that point. It's, it's dramatic. Um, and so that's really interesting. Um, okay, so the theory that we're going to have is that this is driven by induction heads. Now, remember that an induction head, uh, it's kind of doing a nearest neighbor's lookup. So it says, okay, this is my present token. Um, well, actually, maybe I'll, I might even include some previous tokens. Um, but let's just focus on the 
on the present token for a second. Um, so here we have the first paragraph of Harry Potter, because we I, I find it fun to use the first paragraph of Harry Potter. Um, and we have the token D. Okay, so now we're going to go and look for the token D, but shifted one forward. So we're going to look at what happens next. Um, and then we're going to look at what happened next and increase the probability that that is the next token. So we did this kind of nearest neighbors lookup over um, our present token and surrounding context, and then looked for something similar, shifted one forward, and used that to go and predict the next token. Um, and so this, this kind of nearest neighbor um, search over our context is, is really the, the thing that induction heads add. Um, and you have to remember that, that in order to do this, you have to have a previous attention head that can go and do this shifting. So you need to have two attention heads in your circuit to go and implement this. First, you have to have one attention head that can shift information forward. And then you have the attention head that goes and looks, uses that shifted information to go and match something to the shifted version and then go in and increase the logic. So that's what an induction head has, is. And it's very natural that something like this could be used for meta-learning, because it's, it's allowing you to search and find similar situations and then do what happened last time when you had a similar situation. Um, OK, so the hypothesis is that induction heads drive meta-learning. And um, we're going to have a few pieces of evidence. I think that the big ones are uh, for small models, well, small attention-only models, we can really show that uh, induction heads are causing the bump and they're causing meta-learning. Um, and then for larger models, the story is going to be a little bit harder. Um, we'll still be able to say that meta-learning forms at the bump. Um, and uh, we'll still be able to go and say that uh, induction heads form at the same time as the meta-learning forms. Um, but it'll, have to, it'll only be a correlational argument. So um, this does leave open some possibilities that um, maybe, maybe there's additional things that are happening at that bump, at that weird transition. Um, and it, it could be the case that large models are different. So we can, we can sort of rigorously understand this in small models. In large models, we just have correlational evidence. And it could be that there's other things. We'll talk about that more in a minute. OK, so um, for, for small models, for small attention-only models, um, one thing that's nice is you can just sort of mathematically define induction heads. Because remember that they have, um, uh, if, you, if you've watched our early videos where we have this really nice uh, analytical framework for understanding these small models. Uh, an induction head is one that has positive OV, um, output value uh, eigenvalues, and also has positive QK eigenvalues attending to the previous token. So um, that's kind of a, yeah, that, that gives us a, a nice mathematical definition. And we can turn that um, into a score. We, we talked about this more in the previous video with Catherine, but um, you can turn this into a, a measure of how much something is an induction head by um, looking at the fraction of the eigenvalues that are, are positive and then um, going and taking a minimum from OV and QK. Um, and so here what we have is we've colored, um, each one of these lines is a induction head. And we're seeing if you knock it out, how does the uh, meta-learning score change? So um, a positive value uh, means that the meta-learning score uh, increases, but remember that negative value, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a delta and loss, a lower value um, was, was, it meant that, that we were better at, at meta-learning. So um, having a higher value here means that the induction head is improving our ability to do meta-learning. Having a lower value means that knocking it out actually seems to, um, uh, seems to well, knocking it out improves it, so it's, it's sort of doing the opposite. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, and then they're colored by this, this score that tells us how much they are induction heads. So um, the obvious uh, story here is, well, we have this one, uh, uh, this one head that uh, suddenly starts to become an induction head and becomes um, right at the bump, starts to uh, go and cause, uh, yeah, really, really drive meta-learning. Um, I should say this, this line here is the start of the bump. Um, and this line here is the end of the bump. Um, and there's, there's some other heads that uh, also uh, become induction heads and uh, contribute to meta-learning. Now, there's, there's this weird thing where they, they all sort of, um, basically all of the heads seem to sort of rush to contribute to meta-learning and then stop, and then many rec some recover, the induction heads recover. Um, 
we don't know exactly what's going on there, but the theory is probably that they, you know, once they figure out that they can do induction heads, a lot of attention heads try to do it because um, it'd be very useful. And then there's one one winner or a few winners, and the others go and do something else. Um, now, there's one outlier here, which is sort of an induction head. It's a little bit borderline. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it sort of weakly scores on this induction head score. Um, so it has some negative eigenvalues, some positive ones, and it's really not doing meta learning. So we don't know what's up with that. Um, another thing you might ask is, you know, how can there be uh, heads that are that are sort of doing the opposite of meta learning? Well, my guess is that these are heads um, that, when you knock them out, damage the model um, more generally, uh, and um, damaging the model more generally might just mean that you're you're predicting tokens more more uniformly. Um, uh, so that that would be, uh, 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 sorry, um, knocking out more might mean that you're uh, might. I mean, I guess it's it's sort of clear that this theory is, is very speculative, and it's not something I thought through very carefully. But it it could be that um, this this destroys your ability to do n-gram statistics or something like this, um, and so the only thing that remains maybe is your is your meta learning, um, and and it's able to go in and contribute more to the loss. So that that might be one theory. Like if you're if you're bad at predicting early tokens, then the meta learning score would would increase. Um, but yeah, I think the the significant story here to me is that very clearly the induction heads are the ones that are driving meta learning. Um, and because this is an attention only model, there isn't anything else that could be driving meta learning. So we we know that in this case the model is really um, yeah the meta learning is really coming from the induction heads. Um, yeah, so that so yeah, okay. So there's a few other arguments for why um, you might think that uh, uh, in the case of small attention-only models, um, the uh, the induction heads are really driving this meta-learning change. Um, another one is just that we really understand these models, and there isn't really anything else that seems like it could be driving meta-learning. Um, and also, uh, we we really carefully in the previous study were able to analyze the induction head bump, um, which is seems to correspond to this, this meta-learning phase change. Um, and uh, in that case, we were able to do things like look at individual token losses and study how, how those tokens were, uh, yeah, were changing. And those were, were both cases that sort of seem like they, you, could, you could interpret them as kinds of meta-learning, um, and they, they all very naturally flowed from uh, having induction heads. So uh, if you wa haven't watched the previous video, again, I'll encourage you to go, uh, go and watch it. Um, now, for large models, I think this is a trickier argument. Um, when you have thousands of attention heads um, and a large model that's more expensive to run, it starts to become annoying to go um, and do ablations of every single head. Uh, so we're, we're left instead uh, with uh, a more correlational argument. Um, we can see that uh, meta-learning develops uh, right at, at token 10 to the 9, or right around token 10 to the 9. And we can see that that's when induction heads form. Um, and this is across a wide range of model sizes. Um, the score is the score of the attention head that most matches um, an empirical estimate. So uh, we can't use the... Remember that previously in the small models, we could, um, I mentioned we could, we could go and detect uh, induction heads based on their eigenvalues. That doesn't work in large models because of MLPs. Um, so instead... Uh, we have to go uh, and, and come up with some empirical way to detect induction heads. And what we do is we just create a string of some random tokens, um, and uh, we see if, they, if it's able to go and look at, the, look at the next token. And because it's a sequence of random tokens, um, the only way that it could sort of go and look at the token that previously followed the, token, the present token is if it's actually doing induction. It couldn't be relying on other statistics because it's, it's, a, it's a random sequence. Um, so it really has to be doing this kind of search through the context and then look what happens next. That's that's the only way. Um, and these attention heads are really accurate at it, right? Like they're some of these are getting up to like you know suddenly in the 90, 90 percentiles, um, and then they start to fall. I think that's because there's multiple induction heads that are taking on uh, different roles, and so you know maybe one one matches uh, when uh, there's like multiple tokens within a word, and another one matches in, in other cases and so on. So then they, they start to become, you know, only only look at a smaller fraction of those. But um, 
but yeah, there's so at, at 10 to the 9 they form, um, and that's when the meta learning forms as well. So that's that's kind of a natural argument, right? That sort of seems to me, um, you know, it's it, it it would be a very shocking correlation um, uh, to just happen by by happenstance. Um, now it, it could be um, that there's additional things happening there. Um, uh, but we, we know in the small model case that this is really the thing that's driving it, and it, it certainly looks very similar here. We know that the same thing's happening and the same result's happening, and so it's, it's natural to draw that inference. Now, could it be the case um, that there are additional things happening here? Um, yes, it could be, uh, and we'll talk about that more later, but it, it could be that there are additional things driving um, meta-learning and large models that happen form at the same time as induction heads um, and that we haven't yet noticed, uh, and we can, we'll talk about how plausible that is later. But... Um, yeah, to first order, I think uh, it looks like the uh, uh, yeah, it looks like induction heads are probably a big part of the of what's going on. Um, one other thing that's maybe worth mentioning this is this is really an aside. It is kind of cute. Um, this kind of there's sort of this oscillating feeling um, around the induction head bump, and uh, it actually seems like that might be real. It's not something that we studied carefully, um, but it does seem uh, it, it's it's the same thing that we were seeing earlier with. Uh, uh, with having some attention heads sort of over overcorrect or something um, and have to bounce around a little bit. Um, that may or may not be, yeah, it's, it's a theory. Okay, so, um, okay, so our hypothesis is that induction heads uh, are implementing uh, meta-learning and transformers, and that's, that's kind of a wild claim to me. Um, so it's, it, I think it sort of is clear, or it sort of makes sense that induction heads could go and uh, predict the later tokens, so um, or predict copied tokens. So, like here, we have the first paragraph of Harry Potter. Um, you know, we were at uh, we're at this token D. We look back, we see that there's an ERS. We're like, ah, oh, it's going to be ERS again, and we increase the probability of that token. Then we're on the token ERS, and we look back at ERS, and we see ah, the next token was Lee, and we go and we predict Lee, and we we get a better loss on that. So, um, it makes sense that. Induction heads uh, can can copy repeated chunks of text, um, both you know very short turns of phrases um, or names or things like that, and also also longer things. And uh, and I think it also you know it also makes sense that they can like we we saw in in one of the previous videos that there was um, a cross language induction head that looked for trend you know words that are in different languages and then looks one forward and allows you to go and and generate translated versions of text. So. Um, you know, there's, there's other things like this, but and and you know, it makes sense that those would would cause your loss to go down um, later later in your context. But I, you know, is it really plausible that those could be explaining meta learning? Um, like, you know, these large language models they can do all these things that uh, are are different from uh, you know they they aren't just going and root copying things. They they learn functions and they can go and and do all sorts of um, you know, interesting, um, you know, generalizations um, on top of uh, the the thing that they learned. So, uh, yeah. So, could it be that that these induction heads are doing the same thing? Um, well, okay. So one one thing you could think of is that maybe the more general thing that induction heads are doing is they're a kind of meta learning nearest neighbors. They're doing a nearest neighbor search over the context. Um, and that could be, you know, going and matching literal previous token and literal next token. Um, but they can also be softer, and they can also copy more flexible things. We, we saw in a previous video, um, not an induction head, but a copying head that was, was copying um, things like gender and tense and plurality um, to go in and keep sort of manage agreement between adjacent sentences and stuff like this. Well, um, you, can, you could have induction heads be, be soft as well. Uh, the translation head was, was one of those. And... Um, it turns out that these soft induction heads can also help you learn functions. Um, and that's the thing that really made me start to, um, maybe at, at least it was, it, it was the thing that knocked down the last barrier to me of thinking that induction heads might actually be the thing that's driving meta-learning. Um, sorry. So, um, what we have here uh, is uh, the... Uh, uh, yeah, a little toy problem that I set up. So um, we have uh, a, yeah, we're trying to simulate sort of a, 
a pattern matching problem that we know for sure the model um, has never seen before because I, I made it up and it's very silly um, and will allow us to go and explore the role of some softer induction heads in going and learning functions. Okay, so the, the, the puzzle here, um, or the, 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 fun the, the problem here, is um, sometimes the first word is a color and sometimes it's a month. So sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a month. And sometimes the second word is an animal and sometimes it's a fruit. Um, and then we interpret each one of those as a binary variable and we do XOR. So green lizard is false because um, uh, it's, a, it's a color and an animal. And similarly, a month and a fruit is false. But the other combinations, um, so a color and a fruit will be true and uh, a month and an animal will be true. Okay, so um, this is a pretty arbitrary uh, function. And the thing that we'd like to see is when we are on a colon, the model should look for a previous instance that is the same, um, conceptually the same as our situation, and then go and look at what the answer is. So here we have a month animal, and it attends back to a previous month animal and says, ah, it was true. Um, in fact, it's looking for one where the month is the same. So it's April and, and April, and I guess dogs and cats are kind of similar. So maybe it, that's why it likes it. It's, it's also um, looking at March lizard a little bit, which is also a month animal, um, but it's putting less weight there um, because I guess it's uh, uh, less, uh, it's, a, it's less of a close match from its perspective. It's working on, on high level linguistic features. That makes sense. Um, okay, and if we go to January wolf, um, so this is also a month animal and it wants to get his one that's January as well. So it goes and it looks at true and here's another one looks at true. Oh, over here we have March lion, um, I guess wolf and lion are kind of similar. So maybe it likes that. Uh, and here we have a, a, a wolf, you said it's true, um, but it's successfully going and looking at these cases. Okay, let's look at one that isn't, um, uh, so here we have a color and a fruit, so purple lemon. Well, okay, we attend to red cherry, that's true. Um, we go to purple apple, that's true. We go to gray lemon, that's true. So we're looking at these previous cases of this, of this, uh, um, of this function. Um, Okay, here we have another, oh no, here we have a, uh, a month fruit. Um, and we go and we look here and we have um, October cherry um, and it's false. Um, now this one uh, is actually an error. It's, um, it's looking at the wrong thing. Um, it's probably because uh, we have September here and we have September here and it likes that. And then we also have cherry on the previous line. So it's intending to the wrong place, but it's noticing um, that there's a cherry. Oh, I, I guess in this case, there was also a cherry on the previous line. So maybe that's why it got confused, but it's giving most of its probability to a correct case. And it's just putting a little bit of probability on this, this incorrect one. So we're still gonna get the right answer. Um, oh, I guess we're also putting some, some probability here. So uh, yeah, but most of the one that's getting the highest probability is, is still correct. Uh, let's keep going. Um, what about, yeah, we could we could look at this one now. Um, okay, we have red cherry, true. Gray cherry, true. Gray strawberry, true. Red apple, true. So all those are, are correct cases to attend to and use. Um, and now we're back at a month animal and yeah, we're going and seeing July fish is the one that's getting the most. April cat, that's another valid one. We're giving a little bit of probability, actually quite a bit of probability to this one. Um, which is not a correct case to attend to, but mostly we're attending to the correct cases. So we're still gonna go and get the answer right. Um, so the thing that I think is so cool about this is this is a completely made up nonsense function and the model has learned it um, by going and using previous examples. Um, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, 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 well, okay, I guess I'm, I'm sort of making a fool of myself a little bit, but um, here, uh, it, it's not just, you know, I'm showing you ones later on, but, but it's also early, right? So here we have red frog 
and then we're looking to green frog and blue lizard. Um, those are valid cases. We're putting a little bit of probability on one of the wrong ones. Um, and this one, we put a little bit of, well, we put quite a bit of probability on the wrong one, but we're still putting probability on two correct ones. Um, so that might still win out. Um, so this, this also works early in, in the context. Um, works better later in the context, but also works early in the context. Um, and we can look at the effect on the logits and see, you know, when, when are they made more probable? Um, and we can see that, you know, this one is made more probable by a correct match and um, by correct matches and correct matches. And there's all of these cases and it's, it's, it's working. Um, so uh, it really does seem like these, uh, these soft induction heads are able to go and allow for um, the model to learn, learn functions like this, which is, is to me really cool. Um, because uh, the ability to, to learn functions and pattern match like this um, I think was was one of the things about large language models to me that was was sort of most um, most demonstrated that they were really doing in context meta learning, um, and so now we have sort of a theory of of why that's the case. Okay, um, so uh, that's that that hopefully that makes it at least seem plausible that uh, induction heads could be doing at least a lot of meta learning. Um, could other things be contributing? Yes, so it's certainly possible that in large models, other things um, could be contributing. Now, uh, I think there's two kinds of barriers to that as a theory. One is it really seems like they would have to be forming more or less simultaneously with induction heads. Um, so we know that, uh, uh, that when induction heads form, um, that is when uh, the meta-learning forms as well. And so if there's something else, um, it seems like they have to form there as well. Um, it also seems uh, like we'd need to explain uh, why, so we know that that in, in the small attention-only models, meta-learning is really driven by induction heads. Um, we can sort of just look at everything and, and go and show that it's, it's the induction heads that are driving things. And so I think you have to explain then, why is it um, that, first of all, whatever you, you're hypothesizing has to not form in these small models. That, that seems reasonable. It could be that, that there's things that just don't form in small models and do form in large models. But then why is it that the same, we get the same, this constant amount of meta-learning regardless of model size? Um, why is it that it's not, that the large models aren't doing better at meta-learning? Um, now, in some sense, uh, there's, there's a way in which this is a little bit deceiving. Um, which is they are they're they're getting the same number of bits from meta learning, but their loss is lower, and so those are sort of maybe a harder bits of information. And we know that large models have more induction heads and more soft induction heads, um, like the translation head or the the pattern matching head. Those don't exist in really tiny models. Um, so so I think that's a, a little bit of a strange argument to, that I'm making here, but um, it is very s suspicious to me. The same amount of meta learning gets learned in all models. Um, and that does seem like an argument for, I have no idea why that should be the case, but it, to the extent that it's true, it does point in the direction that somehow whatever's going on in all these models is the same. Um, but who knows? I think that is very much an open question. Okay. Now, another question um, that I've been wondering about is, is it possible that induction heads are the reason transformers do better than LSTMs? Okay, so um, let me unpack that a little bit, because that's, that's maybe sort of an out of the, out of the blue question. Um, well, Kaplan et al. Uh, notice that, um, this is the scaling laws paper um, from 2020, um, and they have a plot that, yeah, it's not very emphasized, but they're, they're the ones we got this whole idea of going and looking at um, loss as a function of token index from. Um, well, uh, they make a really interesting observation, which is, uh, if you look at transformers, the loss continues to go down. But if you look at LSTMs of the same size, for a while they do kind of similarly, but then they flatten out. Um, and they tend to flatten out somewhere before token 100. So we have token 100 here, um, and somewhere before then or around then, um, I think I'll, at least a little bit before then, um, they flatten out. Okay. Well, that's kind of interesting because we saw something flatten out earlier. We saw um, that before induction heads form, we flatten out 
you know, we start to flatten it probably around token 40 or 50. And, you know, by token 100, we're really starting to flatten it with a little bit, get a little bit more here. Um, but we're, we're really significantly flattening out and, and are basically flat. We're, we're significantly flat, I think, from, you know, somewhere between token of 50 and 100 to onwards. So, you know, that kind of rhymes with this result. It's not, um, certainly, certainly not uh, error proof, um, but it is, it is really suspicious. Um, to me, that uh, you know these um, that LSTMs are are happening to flatten at the same you know roughly the same time that uh, transformers before they develop induction heads do. Um, and there's another reason why I think it's 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 a little bit suspicious, which is uh, induction heads are fundamentally a mechanism that it seems like transformers couldn't implement because they're searching over the previous context, um, and so you can't do that with a constant amount of time um, per step because you, um, you yeah, you're, it, it, it's, you know, probably, probably it's, purport, you, you have to do some compute for every, every previous step. Or another way to think about this is that going and doing, um, doing search um, for, for every token over all previous tokens, um, navally that's gonna be, be ON squared, uh, but uh, transformers only have ON compute. And so, um, and, and if you were really clever, maybe you could ON, make it ON log N, but I, I think probably, uh, you know, neural nets aren't discovering those algorithms. And even if they were, it's still still larger than ON. So it really seems like that's something that it's, it seems like LSTMs couldn't be doing. Um, and so we we know that before uh, induction heads form, transformers are, are relying on these simple copying heads. Um, and those do seem like something that uh, LSTMs uh, could, be, could be doing analogous something analogous to, you know, just being like, oh, you know, I saw this token previously, probably it's going to happen again. Um, and so it, it really, yeah, I don't know. And, and again, this is, this is, this is speculation. I don't you know. I don't think we, we, we rigorously know this is the case, but it, it is kind of suspicious. And I, you know, I, I do wonder. Um, so uh, that was a fun little, fun little thing. Um, one other thing that I think is worth talking about um, is, well, okay. So at least, now, okay, I think this is a, a little, um, uh, a little unclear. But um, if you put if you put your con your context on a on a log axis, these these curves of these meta learning curves, they do look pretty, um, uh, they do look pretty linear. And if you, especially if you put your your loss on a log axis as well, so it it does seem like meta learning within a context is probably modeled pretty well um, as a scaling law, and. Uh, there's a paper by by Marcus Hutter um, from DeepMind, um, and uh, he gives uh, sort of a, an argument that we should really expect models to follow scaling laws, um, at least with respect to data. That as you go and you give them more data, um, you should expect them to follow a scaling law. Um, uh, and something I found interesting as I was thinking about this is, you know, these models uh, they follow. Okay, so we seem to be observing scaling laws. Well, you know, the actually, I think the case of, of meta-learning with induction heads sort of matches the theoretical argument that, um, that Marcus is giving uh, better probably than the standard case of going and training models. Um, so um, the, the theoretical setup in the, in, in the Hutter paper is um, that you, you're observing a bunch of data points and if you've seen um, if you've seen a particular problem before, then in the future you get zero loss on it. So um, you're observing the sequence of of training examples, and then um, if you see the same thing again, uh, you go and you 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 get it perfectly, and otherwise you you get a bad loss, and you get the same bad loss. So um, that seems very similar to having a context and seeing a bunch of tokens, and if you see um, a token that matches something earlier in your context, you can look at what happens next and get an, a, a very, very small loss. Um, th that seems very similar. And so you can, you can really take just all the arguments um, that are in this paper and they run through for the case of meta-learning um, with, with induction heads. Um, and so we should really, really expect scaling laws. So I thought that was kind of fun. Okay, so in summary, um, meta-learning seems to form uh, really abruptly in the span of a few hundred steps. Um, and induction heads form at the same time, um, so that's, that's interesting. 
Um, induction heads can be seen as a kind of nearest neighbor meta-learning algorithm. Um, and we saw that they could even, even learn functions um, and in addition to, to copying text. Um, and induction heads seem to substantially cause meta-learning. Um, certainly, they form at the same time as meta-learning, and in small models, they can really be shown to be causing it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. This is, I guess I'm just excited about all of this, because it seems like it's getting really, um, you know, potentially some deep insight or, 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 or getting at some, some of, you know, what seems to me one of the, the biggest mysteries of, of these large models. Um, and so that was, was really exciting to me. Uh, in any case, uh, thanks for listening.